Ladies and gentlemen, today we have Mr. Ross Gates on the show, and he's going to be leading us in our Growth Hacks edition. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One sec, just setting this up. Cool. So the first thing I want to go over is a conversation that Brian and I have a lot, which is that if you can think of a, con or one sec, I should actually type this in first. So the first thing I want to go over is a conversation that Brian and I have a lot, which is if you can go to Craigslist and you can see any of these companies, uh, one sec, we have chat. Oh, you put it in the chat. And you can see any of these companies uh, or sections in Craigslist. There's a billion dollar business that has been built for each of these sections. Um, if you think about housing, so if you think about housing um, in each of these categories, like uh, apartment and housing, there's been, you know, uh, renting, Airbnb, uh, housing buying, there's been Zillow and a bunch of other online platforms. If you think about pictures or photography during these categories, there's been Instagram, Snapchat. Um, and so I'm just going to go through a couple of these categories and talk about the companies that have come out of them and what some of their growth hacks have been. I'm going to start with, we'll start with Groupon actually. Groupon is not actually on this list. Um, Brian, do you want to talk about this or I can also talk about it? Oh, Groupon's not on this list? Uh, well, I mean, Groupon's not in Craigslist. I guess discounts might be in Craigslist. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, Groupon's a, t a weird one. It's a timing one. Um, I think that's, that's a more intricate one. Um, I think I might have shared the wrong deck with you. Gotcha. I'd still go over it. So Groupon's whole um, hack happened during 2008. While every other company was declining because people were trying to save money, Groupon basically... Did the exact opposite where they helped people save money by going very local and asking a bunch of companies what their uh, discounts were and then aggregating those discounts and sending out a daily newsletter with every single discount that you could get in your area well i think ross if if you want to even like let's let's go like historically take a take a step back even further if you want to you know say something cheesy um craigslist existed uh, before Craigslist even existed, before the internet existed. It was just something that was done in newspapers. If you wanted a job, if you wanted to buy something, if you wanted a couch, if you wanted apartment housing, you'd have to pay like $10, $20, $25 to post in the newspaper. And um, this would get printed out. It would be in your local paper. And a lot of commerce, like the back quarter, the back third of the paper um, would have all this information being printed and posted on a daily basis. So what Craigslist did was basically say, hey, like the, the cost associated with posting $10, $20, $30 per post in, in the newspaper um, is kind of onerous uh, for a lot of the people to place. And so while the papers were making a ton of money on this, um, essentially like the market liquidity of particular items, anything from classified ads to job postings to, to housings to apartments, um, there would be a built-in cost that the, that the paper was using as a tax to tax commerce between people, P2P people in general. And so, um, you know, if the paper would have made this like a free service or next to free service, Craigslist would have never had the opportunity to, to blast this out. And so, you know, Cra Craigslist is obviously, it was like one of the first like billion dollar companies to come from the internet. Um, and it's really about the velocity of trades and deals and user generated content. They, they, so many different concepts that occurred in Craigslist that were like revolutionary um, and, and yet so simple that it, it's one of those prime examples of, you just have to be better than what already currently exists and the newspapers and all the local newspapers and all the city papers, the costs were too high for the value that they generated. And so Craigslist was like, well, we don't really need to make money on all this stuff. If we just make money on job posts and job postings, we can serve the rest of the, the internet 
for sales services, discussion forums for practically free. And, and that's what they did to gear up enough traffic uh, so that they could uh, give away 90% of their product and just charge for the one product, uh, which was, I think they charge for a couple different sections now, but they definitely charge to, to place a job posting. So to go off of that, this is all about the growth hacks that large companies have used and how you can apply similar tactics today. There's a lot of these companies that spawned at the beginning of the internet that I kind of dislike telling their stories because while they're great stories about behemoth companies, you look at them and go, well, I wasn't around in 1992 to start my company. How am I supposed to take advantage of this? So is there an uh, insight that you would take from this that is still applicable even if you didn't have the same timing? 100%. You just have to be better than, yeah. so, so faster turnaround times, right? So velocity of, of, if you can have commerce interact faster, if there's a way to, to have liquidity um, go faster than what's currently in the market, like you can win, right? So um, user generated content, so user generated content still wins to this day. So if you get the most generated user generated content, you have most uh, data, which gives you the higher network effect, um, how to build a network effect. If that's part of a consumer product should have a network effect built into it these days. If it doesn't have a network effect innately built into it, you're probably going to lose. What's the um, network effect here? Is it just that you have posters and you have buyers who are the network who want to come see what's available? Yeah. I mean, the more, the more items for sale and the more jobs on Craigslist or the more housing on Craigslist, um, the more people will come there for housing because it, it starts to have competition. And once you have the best competition, uh, it drives down prices. And so then you're getting a price variance um, from you know, the st status quo place to, to rent a home. Uh, you move down because of the competition for the other posts. You basically create the competition on the platform itself to drive down prices uh, and where supply will meet demand, which creates the higher velocity of the. Of how, the do, how does that work as opposed to Google? I mean, here you're creating more demand to drive down or supply to drive down price. And yet Google, the more demand there is, the higher the price is because they're an ads engine and they're charging more people to advertise more. You're saying, so, what are the internal economic dynamics of that? Yeah, how, how would someone know which one to take advantage of and what to build in? What's more profitable for them? I think that um, I, would, I would challenge your statement. It's, it's a question, but I would, I would say that part of your statement is wrong. And the part that is wrong is that initially, it wasn't more expensive on the Google ads, right? The, re the main reason like Amazon was able to become the way it is today is because they put all of their money into Google ads at the beginning. Like, and so anybody that was searching for a book, Amazon appeared first, right? So that's like, I would challenge that assumption. Now the prices are higher for the amount of people that are searching, but these are also in commoditized, places, right? So like small business loans, insurance products, like they're very expensive because there's a lot of competition, not because they have more people using. Gotcha. So you're saying if someone starts a marketplace now, similar to Craigslist at the beginning, if you charge nothing to post and you charge nothing to basically advertise, you'll get a bunch of traffic if at some point you get so much traffic that you want to advertise or something, then you can do what Google did and kind of raise prices on posts. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, this is, this is marketplace dynamics. And for marketplace dynamics, like it's, it's, it's a whole two, three hours. We could, we could have like three episodes or three shows on marketplace dynamics and kind of like the game theory behind it. Um, okay. Basically, uh, the short and sweet of it is, is if you have demand in a marketplace, you will be able to find supply. Um, and marketplaces need to have something special about them. Um, the most, the, the, the most uh, 
biggest marketplace uh, of, of recent, and you're going to go over some marketplaces in, in a minute or two here that I know that, that where there is demand um, and you're supply and you're a little bit supply restricted was like the silk road on the dark web, right? There is demand, right? And so because people will jump through all of the hoops in the world and put in the Tor browser and, and buy Bitcoin, uh, because they have demand for a product that they cannot get anywhere else. In most of the cases, this is not the case, but it's, it's, it's about tapping into that demand or increasing demand with your marketplace. And I, I don't want to go into all the key dynamics of marketplaces. I built a marketplace. I've advised for a marketplace. So it's, uh, it, it, there's a lot in there. Okay. Let's not go over that yet. But let's go over um, the how marketplace like Zillow. We're just going to jump to that next. Uh, okay. How they grow fact their way to success. So, okay, cool. We made a new window. Um, so they're, they're a marketplace and I would say they're really impressive because although they started when the internet kind of started, they started a little later on and their whole hack was um, just like Amazon getting books online, they got real estate online. And the way they did it is they started off manually going and finding um, in 300 different cities, the article um, information and data on housing prices and rental prices so that they could write articles about the fluctuations in those prices over time. And for the first seven years, they had no advertisement budget. They were just content, they created it, um, and they got a lot of people to come and want to understand the value of their own home and how it was going up and down. With all of that data, they gained a lot of uh, traction because they could go to every single franchise that was a real estate business and say, hey, we're getting all of this organic traffic. Um, I think they had like 30 million daily or monthly active users and something like uh, 2008-ish. And they could go to those franchises and say, hey, we're getting all of this organic traffic with people who want to look at houses. Can we put all of your housing data on our website? And at that point, all of those franchises didn't really think the internet would amount to much. And so they all signed deals saying, I don't even know if they signed, but they said, yes, we'll put all of our data. We'll put uh, our real estate on the MLS server, which is the multiple listing system, which uh, local real estate agencies used to sell. And we'll also put it on Zillow. Now, um, 20 or 15 years later, all of those franchises put their data on Zillow because there's so much organic traffic, but they don't want to. They don't want to because Zillow has ways of making its own money. And by having a complete data advantage over the entire industry, because while they see all of the data prices and sales that go through Century 21, Cobell Banker, uh, Remax, and all of the different agencies, um, each of those individual agencies only sees a small amount of data. So if Zillow was to ever open a franchise and promote its own real estate or realtors, it could completely destroy the market because it has 20 years of historic data on what to do. They actually got a lot of publicity um, because in 2007, they were one of the first uh, places to say, hey, based on all of this historical data we have, we think it's not a good time to buy a house because of what's about to come. Um, and so I think their main growth hack is just like Craigslist, they're aggregating the aggregators uh, that's what they started as. And now because they've been aggregating the aggregators for so long, they are they have such a data advantage that they're a threat to not be friends with. Because if you're not their friend, then, then they'll steal from you. Also, um, the whole point of being part of a franchise in real estate is because they provide you better tools than any other franchise you could be part of. So the franchises themselves could get off of Zillow and then have their own data advantage, but they would have to tell their realtors, hey, we're getting off of Zillow. And so for the next couple of years, you're probably gonna see a decrease in your sales because we're gonna have less organic traffic, but then it's gonna go back up and then you know, you're gonna be selling strong again. The problem with that is real estate is a commoditized market. So while it's good for the company, the realtors themselves probably don't care and they're just as happy working for Zillow as somebody else. So if any of the realtors or franchises tried that method of breaking free, 
they probably wouldn't be able to because they lose other realtors because it only benefits them. So I think that um, just what was really interesting is the two parts, the making a marketplace by getting everyone's data and getting lock in, and then also using that data to have a content strategy where you can teach all of your consumers something that they don't already know that nobody else can teach them because they don't have enough data to come to the same conclusions. Well, I'm going to take over here for a second um, and show you something. Uh, uh, it's a little bit personal, but whatever. Uh, so I owned a house in Concord and um, this is, talk about the, uh, the, the hack that they have and what they have and they, what they do better than anybody else in the world is um, the Z estimates. And I don't know if they remove that. That's so weird. Did they remove it? You can usually see it if you go to the map view, it tells you what all the homes in a neighborhood are worth. So strange. So uh, Ross, you, you totally like hit the nail on the head with like content creation. Um, but what you couldn't get uh, in, like what you couldn't get in before what the MLS was the Z estimate and they, and they coined this the Z estimate and it, and it became so, so prevalent that that's, they were telling the consumers that were continually getting, creating the habit of coming back to, um, back to the site over and over again to essentially see, Oh, what is my, what is my house worth this month? And, and so by giving that away for free, here we go. You're, you're creating the habit of coming to the site and you're creating thought leadership and you're creating the ability of information um, that's going to give you like thought leadership. It's going to give people a reason to continually come back. If there's a dramatic spike in difference and you're signed up, Redfin does this now too. Zillow does this. If you have a dramatic spike in the price of your property, they'll send you an email and say, Hey, because of these types of factors, your estimate has jumped uh, completely. And what this did was create a mechanism that I can consistently email the potential consumer down the road um, or, or continually down the road, there'll be a potential consumer, but I could consistently email them new information and content that's going to keep the user engaged. And so a lot of people, I mean, most people in the United States, their number one asset is their home. So understanding the value of their home is an asset is, is basically understanding their net worth. And so keeping co people continually engaged is, is something that they did really, really well. Um, to key on, on, on a couple points, you said aggregate the aggregators, right? So, um, and then make something accessible that wasn't accessible before because the MLS before was not accessible, right? Only, only real estate agents had access to it. So what they did, when you're aggregate the aggregators and you unlock it for a new audience, you have the potential for a really, really good uh, growth curve and growth trajectory if that audience has demand. Great example. I'm gonna share my screen now. Cool, cool. One sec. Yeah, you can see the price jump says on Zillow's. So I just want to figure out how to show myself. Boom, that's how. Um, I just want to add to that. So that how you use this for what you're doing today is kind of, you, like you said, it aggregate the aggregators and get a data advantage that nobody else has. Um, uh, Jake, who's on here all the time with something like Sway Metrics, if you have a metrics platform where you can aggregate metrics from your entire industry, then you can come to conclusions that you couldn't come to before. Uh, there's a couple of platforms that have done this where they post thought leadership, which is you know what we learned about Facebook ads after spending a million or $2 million running different campaigns. Some of them have spent that much money, but some of them don't spend that much money. They just look at the entire amount of money spent by each one of their users and then analyze the, the total campaigns in aggregate so that they can give you some uh, metrics. So whatever your industry is, if you create a very simple tool to help that industry 
where you can get data from the people using it, then you can provide thought leadership that uh, wasn't wasn't readily available in a small chunk, but when you amass all the data together, you come to a conclusion. Cool. Um, next, let's talk about Slack. I actually wanted to ask you a question, Brian. There is a, uh, we, we, we talked about one of the growth hacks being their help page. Yeah. I Googled this over and over and over and I yeah. couldn't find it. Um, yeah, the head of growth at Slack, they said, um, and oh, this was in 2018, the number one new activation channel or new channel for new Slack users was the FAQ page. Um, all of their information on how they can help and how to use Slack. And on every single page that they had within their resources and their FAQ page on how to use Slack and how to use all the features out of Slack, they had a sign up button and basically say, sign up, it's free. And, and that was one of their, their main growth hacks after they had a large enough network that wanted to use and educate themselves about their product. Um, that was, I think it was 2018, that was their largest uh, channel, right? Um, do, do you wanna tell the origin story of Slack? Sure. Um, so just starting at the, at the beginning, Stuart Butterfield was one of the original founders of, or one of the founders of Flickr. And then after Flickr, he decided to start Slack. Um, he started it as a gaming company. They were going to make a multiple uh, player online game. But in creating that company, they found that one of the big problems they were coming up against was how they internally were actually communicating as a team. And there were a bunch of developers who got so excited about solving their own problem um, about how to work as a team that they eventually switched, stopped working on the game, and just started working on that. I'm just going to pin my video. So yeah, it was, so it was a MMORPG, very large uh, online world. And this, Slack was initially their in-game experience for chat. So the ways that they were sharing emojis, think of like, Twitch or Discord, um, the way that Twitch and Discord got started um, with, or blew up, they didn't necessarily start there. Discord started for gaming. Twitch ended up becoming gaming and feeding that community. Slack came out of the gaming uh, ecosystem. So they, people enjoyed the communication uh, layer, the communication and messaging center so well, and it was so much attention that people were going to the game not to play the game, but just to use the messenger. And once they figured out that people were going to the game just to use the messenger, they, they pivoted and they said, let's just work on this messenger because it's, it's rad. Yeah. Um, just to go into some of the growth hacks that they started at the beginning. So one, they had the online community using the messenger, but uh, one of the things they attribute most of their success to was just being completely focused on the product at the beginning. They got their product because he already, because uh, Stuart Butterfield already had connections from his previous company. He got it into some large companies uh, and focused on just making the enterprise experience as easy to use as possible for those companies by letting them use it and then having his developers figure out all of the, uh, the things that people were spending the most time on, all the things that were kind of janky that people were ignoring. And because of that, that he figured out that the top two things that people wanted were the ability to share um, files and the ability to search everything that they'd done. And so he made those two core to Slack and very easy to use. A good example of this is if you actually sign up for Slack, you can see that um, their onboarding experience is very minimal. Like they have a bot that introduces you and says, hi, like here are some channels, but they focus so heavily on making it so easy to use that there are no introductory videos or anything like that. Um, you just jump right into it. And this is easy to ignore. Um, I worked at a design consultancy and my favorite quote from there is, good design is invisible, only bad design gets called out or insulted. Because if it's good design and it works exactly how you want it to work, you never really notice that it works exactly how you want it to work because you never appreciate something working so well until you click on a button that doesn't do what you expect it to do. So um, that was one of the things at the beginning. I think that the, the biggest hack though is making it free and making it a community that you have to participate with multiple people in. Um, another thing that you may not notice is that Slack never tries to upsell you to their more expensive product. 
you can go and sign up for it, but never does it say, you know, your trial's over or maybe you should upgrade. Um, it only tells you the limitations. It tells you, hey, you're over five gigabytes, so we're gonna start erasing stuff. But it never says like you're over five gigabytes, you should upgrade. Um, it also says, you know, this is older than 10,000. Um, but they don't try to push you into stuff. So by making it free and a good experience when it's free, and by making it so that it's a community where when you sign up and you're the first person to know about it, you have to immediately vet all of your friends because you can't use it by yourself. Um, it makes it the network effect and it makes it viral because one person invites three people, invites nine. So those are two things that um, if you're making a community, everyone should add. Brian, do you have anything to say? What do you think Slack could do in this new environment to, to grow or what, what can they do now at this point? In the environment of everybody staying at home? Yeah. What do you, how, like if you, if you ran Slack, King of Slack, what would you do? I don't know how expensive video chat is, but that's one of their premium features and everybody's signing up for Zoom so that they can get video chat. So personally, I would make a portion of video chat or a limited amount free in Slack, even if you're not on premium, because everyone's going to your competitor, Zoom and all of their you know, uh, you know, communication tools. And if they could get it for free right here, then they would tell more people that, that they can get it for free. You can see Zoom stock going up because of this. So I think Slack could also do the same. What would you do? That's a really good one. It's gonna to be tough to beat. I'm gonna go completely opposite direction. I'm gonna say, you know, Substack at all? Do you bring that up? A little bit. Yeah. So let's let's talk about Substack. Um, this is one of the fastest growing companies in in uh, Silicon Valley right now. I think they just got uh, like a pretty large round backed by Andreessen Horowitz. Um, on the surface, it's pretty simple, right? It, it's you have top post. Each one of these posts is an email newsletter. Um, kind of coming from like the angel list and the product hunt ethos of like having the newsletter um, and, and starting with an email list as your, as your community, as a way to like start your company. Uh, essentially, they allow for people to uh, join the email newsletter and they get a percentage of the money or so you can, you can charge consumers to join the email newsletter. Um, daily, weekly, whatever, right? So it's got some fee, pseudo Patreon. It's a little like Patreon. And I, I, what I would do is start to charge per channels in a Slack community. So there's a lot of like influence out, out there that have community and they got, you got Patreon, but it's not exactly um, monetary driven. So Patreon is monetary driven, but access to certain channels of certain influencers and direct access to influencers. If you were able to monetize availability of a channel and, a, and, and, a, and turn on a fee to be part of a channel within a Slack community, uh, I think that would uh, be extremely valuable. I had a friend who was, who was using Slack free, the free version, and he does um, day trading. And so you, he does this all manually right now uh, on Slack where he locks out the channels. And if you pay per month for a particular follower, uh, the, the person then posts all of their trades in the Slack channel as they make their trades during the day. And so I think there's like a huge amount of opportunities there where um, getting direct access to an influencer, getting direct access to an expert and turning on some premium features within Slack where you can start to kind of fine tune who gets access to what channel from a monetary perspective would create a whole new type of uh, monetization scheme for the company and for the people who use currently use Slack. Cause you can't, you can't charge to join a Facebook group, right? You can't charge to join a Slack. You have to move all that payment processing offline. I agree. They would have to make it so that you could still join that Slack community for free and that their payment method was somehow through the amount of payment that is for that channel. You get a portion of it. Because I think that their, their greatest strength there would be to still have a free community that spreads virally, 
but then people in that community talk and upgrade you. As soon as they say, this is a paid feature, you can have paid channels, but every single member of your group has to pay $5.99 a month. I think it would be much less valuable because the original cost of whoever wants to sell their product in that paid channel, they'd have to pay, I don't know, $500 a month for everyone in their group. And that opportunity cost would be too high. Agreed. Yeah, so I think there's there's different plan mechanisms where they could externalize the cost of the group versus internalizing the cost of the group owner. So right now, all their payments come from the group owner versus um, trying to distribute the cost amongst the community. Completely agree. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I've actually, there's a lot of Slack groups where they, they charge you $50 or and I heard of one Slack group recently that charged you $1,800 to join, but I would do this instead because also when you're paying to join the Slack group, you can't actually see the quality of what's in it until you join. They tell you, and, and in here you probably could, if that person who has the private channel is posting in some public channels, some of their stuff to entice you to join. Um, they say that when you make a Facebook group, if you're under a hundred people, you should make it so that it's private and no one can see before they join. And the reason that they say that you should do that is so no one can see your extreme lack of content. They join your group without knowing what's actually in it. And I think the same thing would apply to Slack. Cool. Um, moving on to the next thing that they have, which some companies have, but a lot don't, is Slack has an uh, integration marketplace. And this helps because they make affiliates basically out of every single company that wants to be in their marketplace. Um, and if you, if you have an integration with Slack, you basically say, hey, like we're Zapier, we integrate with Slack. You should use us, you should also use them. Here's how to use your current tech stack and combine it all instead of using something new. And so it helps fit in. So just um, how everyone should use that today. I don't know that I wouldn't start with integration. Like we have a platform and we're not starting with integrations because we want you to see how you like using our product as it's not related to everybody else. But eventually, if you want more SEO juice and more traffic and link backs, then integrations with other platforms make sense because you can work off their prestige and you can be in their marketplace as well where they probably already have active users going through looking at everything they integrate with and get traffic yeah. that way. SEO and links are, are incredibly valuable um, to grow your brand and grow your brand online. So getting those, those juicy high PR Slack links to, to Alpha Voice or whatever product you know, we integrate Slack with would be amazing. Agree, that's, that's rad. Agree. Um, there's some other things that Slack does, but that's kind of all I really want to go over. All of the, so I did a research on like six articles last night for them. And a lot of the other ones are hacks that you can do once you're already really big, which are helpful, but I don't feel like they're as helpful to people who are just starting off if you don't already have 300,000 followers on Twitter. Um, one of the hacks though, I don't know, maybe it is. I'll just say a couple of them, but one of the hacks they have is because they had 300,000 followers on Twitter and they, they posted over 100,000 times on Twitter, um, they wow. started a, a new, yeah, I don't even know how you do that programmatically. Yeah, um, have to. Yeah. They started a new Twitter channel, which was everyone who praises Slack. And I don't know if that's internally in Slack or on Twitter, but they probably just created a bot wherever they heard a positive phrase with their name or their hashtag and put it on their own channel. Um, or they put it on that new channel. So that's something that they've gotten a lot of awareness and just like it's been picked up by a bunch of PR campaigns because it's kind of unique that so many people love their product so much that they're willing to post about it. Um, the other thing um, just from all of these articles is that they define a new category of product. So Jake, Jake Pimentel is gonna uh, present tomorrow on Blue Ocean, which is all just kind of about how you make a product that doesn't seem to fall in the category of anything that currently exists. So when you compare your product to what someone's currently using, it doesn't, it doesn't substitute it, it adds something new. And so you're not asking them to switch so much as 
try something they've never tried before. And Slack did this where internal communication was mostly done with email and text message and a bunch of platforms that weren't combined before Slack. And so um, while they interviewed, you know, what were you using before you were using Slack, 30% of people would say, you know, they had a tool like Jira or something like that. But 70% of people would actually just respond to their interview like we weren't using anything because they didn't actually consider in their mind that email or text message was a valid substitute to Slack. Um, and in their mind, it was a completely brand new category. So when it was a new category, it was easy for them to make the choice to try it and to tell other people about it because it was something new. That's all I have for Slack. Brian, anything to add before we move on? No, that's a lot on Slack, man. Let's, let's go on to the next one. Okay, what's next? Brian, what's next? All right, we could do Instagram or Groupon. Let's, let's do Instagram. Okay. The gram, the infamous Instagram. Okay. Um, where, how'd the gram do it? Jody, it's, a, it's on the slide. How'd the gram do it? We got it. We got, we got a slide. Thank you for making the new slide, Jody. All right. So Instagram, uh, Instagram, uh, timing, timing, timing. Um, wow. The, the, their competitor is missing my, I can't remember the name of the competitor, but it was, a, there were two apps uh, on, on the Avid, um, all right, let's talk about environment. So, so before Instagram, people had like big cameras, right? So big cameras and you would go and you would edit your photos and then you would do it and you post it. And, and it took like a long, long process. And the uh, actual like camera pixel rate of, of phones was absolutely terrible. And so um, now comes along the iPhone. They put a camera on the phone. That's not that bad. It's not, it's still not great today. It's crazy good, but it was, it was like good enough where you could share like low quality pictures over, over, um, mobile networks. Right. So, so there was a couple of things of technology that had to occur to make this new, this new feature available. Now, people have always been sharing pictures since photos have been around. And before photos, there's, you know, people painting pictures and family portraits. And, and so that's always been a thing. They didn't like, they didn't hop in and like create a brand new category. They just made the access available to create it uh, way more fluid. So, so once again, and, and once you make more access and, and make it a more fluid experience, uh, essentially you have the velocity of the usage start to climb again. So we talked about that at the beginning, like Craigslist had the velocity uh, of commerce. It was too much friction involved with in terms of buying ads on the classified section of the newspaper. Craigslist comes along, you have the velocity of commerce. Instagram comes along, you have the velocity of the um, photo industry, right? So, so, and it completely wiped out another industry, which is Kodak. Kodak ended up having to declare bankruptcy because of the velocity in Instagram and how good the, the pixel rate on the cameras were. Crazy, crazy. So, um, Kevin Seistrom, uh, he had, they, they had another network before, right? So, they, so uh, Instagram as a, this is another case, very similar to Slack, where there's this big giant product and social network that Kevin Seistrom and his team made and where they found um, the thing that people, it was like Foursquare mixed with Facebook, mixed with photos. And the thing that the team found in, the, in this old product was that people were just on there sharing photos. That was the only thing that they were doing. And he used, um, now Ted Leonsis, I, I saw him, heard him year, years ago, if you want to, uh, if you want to grow a product, you have to find a community and empower them. And Kevin Seistrom of Instagram's empowerment was let's give these four or five filters right out of the box. Now these were like Linux based filters that were open source and publicly available. He didn't actually make the image filters. Um, he basically was like, here, you can get a little bit more creative by adding one of these four filters. So, he had a community 
The community, once again, was only using one of the features of his product, very similar to Slack. They ripped that out. They already had their old community. The community was like, hey, where is my, um, you know, where is my features? He had experience working at a couple different companies. He had a connection to TechCrunch. And I would say the main PR hack that he had right out of the box, oh, there's, there's three or four things going on here. One, he had an existing community. He had PR relationships with TechCrunch. They launched on TechCrunch. And within, within like 24 hours, they had like 100,000 users after they launched on TechCrunch. So they, they leveraged PR and PR relationships. Um, they leveraged open source software to uh, enable a community to be, an empower community to be more creative. And the fourth one is that they were free. Like this is a, a crazy difference, right? So at the time of, of Instagram, um, I had actually worked on an app for a client that, that had some similar ideas, but they weren't like, oh, well, let's make it a social network. They were like, let's, let's allow these custom frames and we'll charge for these frames that you put around the photo. And then like we can get brands to make these frames and, and put it out. And, and you know, it was, a, it was a total disaster. There was, there was, not, there was no like embedded network effect. If you're gonna go consumer today on the web, you have to do it, have to have a network effect. Um, and I would say it's a combination of those four things that right timing, a new feature came on the iPhone, the camera came, it was good enough, People were already doing this in the past. They were just doing it in a very complicated way. They had a PR hack. They, had, um, they, they leveraged open source things that people have been using before on Linux for years. They had an existing community uh, and they empowered them and they, they did really good PR and they kept the servers up. They, they tell stories, if you, if you watch some of his interviews, uh, that, that they were basically on the clock for like the first month like just cranking up servers and getting servers up to, to keep up with the demand. And they almost went out. They basically had to raise money to uh, keep the servers alive. The only thing I'm going to add to that is um, we had a conversation previously where you said that they always differentiated themselves because they were photo first. And when people ask, you know, how does Instagram still exist because there's Twitter and Facebook and all these other ones, you don't go to Twitter to look at photos. You don't go to Facebook to just look at photos. But if you just want to be inspired, because they were always photo first and how they delivered information, they delineated themselves enough that they always had a space to exist. Yeah, I'm trying to, it was, it was like a hip camera or something like that. It was a really good app. And um, they, they were, they, they could have won. They came out with like way more features um than instagram had at the beginning and and basically like they were way farther ahead than instagram was um right out of the gate but but instagram slowly won uh because they were free so how do people use these same principles and what they're doing today well free for consumer any... works network effects for consumer works you really you have, have to understand yeah go ahead do you have to raise a bunch of money to be free for consumers? Seems like a lot of these companies only are able to exist because they're funded by venture capital until three or four years later when they can start to monetize. Mostly off data because they still don't actually sell that much. So, so yes, the monetization really didn't even occur until they, they plugged in Facebook. There was no monetization on Instagram. Like, you had to plug in Facebook ads to, to make it like worth the, the millions of dollars that it was. Um, I, I mean, uh, to get the network effect, and if you're looking for like a data advantage, a network effect, like free is a way to get more data. Gotcha. Good. That's all I have. I, you literally covered every single point that I covered in my notes as well. That's awesome. Cool. Uh, do you want to talk about one more before we sign off? Want to talk about Groupon? Um, I don't want to talk about Groupon. Do you want to talk about Groupon? Not really. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about some companies that like, you can't easily actually replicate. Mm -hmm. I don't know. My favorite to talk about are like the SpaceX's of the world, which it's, it's fun to talk about, but it's hard to replicate because they are so capitally intensive, capital intensive that 
as a startup to start to do something like that. We all love it. Okay. Hipstamatic. That was that was the competitor of Instagram early on. Let's talk about suing the government or getting sued by the government. Oh wow. That's an Uber one too. I know, I was gonna write that in there. So I I have conversations with people about startups all the time. And one question I always get when you say what a startup has done is they say, is that ethical? And you're like, define ethical. Like Uber what is ethical. Uber broke bunches of laws in order to basically get enough publicity. SpaceX sued the government because the government wasn't being fair and they it forced down other large industry tyrants, probably what they thought they were. And yet both of these companies are heroes at this point. So to get started, if someone doesn't completely understand what you're doing, sometimes you have to make some noise in order to get started. So let's talk about that. Do you want to go through, let's, let's start with Uber. SpaceX is pretty quick actually. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, there was some, so as Uber is one of those examples where the friction of the existing product is, is too cumbersome. I can tell you a story in terms of like 2010, 2011, uh, I'm traveling for business and um, I, I need to catch a flight and I call the, the taxi company and the taxi company is going to say, says, yeah, like we'll have a taxi there. No problem. We'll get in there and terminate your fright, flight. 30 minutes later, nothing. 45 minutes later, I'm on the phone with again. They're like, oh, it's going to be another 45 minutes. I'm like, I can't wait another 45 minutes. I'm going to miss my flight. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll have this one. 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So I couldn't wait. I had to get out. I had to walk uh, four blocks to, to a main street and to, to go catch a taxi. Um, and Uber won because like, it worked, right? Like the taxi, the current taxi apps and phone numbers, they're just unreliable. They weren't trustworthy. Unless you're on a main drag and a main street and, and you saw taxis going all the time, you couldn't trust in, in this was in Chicago, um, that, that you would be able to get a taxi when you needed it in a certain amount of time. Um, now, if you wanted to go compete in that space, the obvious thing would be, like, oh, let's do a better taxi. And if you wanted to do a better taxi, the regulations, the costs associated with be- building a taxi company, you had to pay off the right people in the mayor's office. You had to pay these regulations. You had to get, um, there was these things called shields or, 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 or uh, pack- medallions. medallions in New York City. They were being sold for a million dollars. This was like people's whole entire retirement in New York City for the taxi medallions, which now uh, I'm sure are, you know, the, the price of those things were, are, have dropped tremendously. So there was, you know, not a great uh, experience. And so they came in and were like, cool, we're going to have people let anybody with a black town car uh, be able to take up passengers from their phone and create this like distributed network. The, the governments and the mayor's offices were like, no, you're not. We're not getting paid for this. We're blocking you. And that was their hack. Their hack was to get stopped by the, and say, how could you stop people from driving? How can you stop people from making money? Um, you guys are corrupt. City of Chicago, city of, D- city of DC, DC, you guys are corrupt. You're blocking the process for us and in, in having economics, and they would go to the newspapers, and they would do like exclusive interviews with all of these different newspapers. So, and they would like rub their faces in it. They didn't try to sneakily do this. They wanted to get blocked by the government. They wanted it to go to court because this was their way to get free advertisement in all the newspapers across the country. As they went from city to city and got blocked, um, it was it was brilliant. It was a brilliant PR hack. And um, that was their PR hack. And they had a great product. I mean, it was more expensive than tactics at the beginning. It was only black town cars. Uh, but the alternative was, the, the alternative to black town cars themselves were very, very expensive. Uh, they had a minimum rate. They had a minimum hours. They, they were very expensive. And, and they were very reliable. And then taxis were unreliable. 
within the text messaging and, and mobile applications that they had. And Uber was very reliable. So the reliability and security was worth the uh, increased cost because taxis were cheaper at the beginning and, and Uber was a premium product. Interesting. So it sounds like you got to try something that was of a high quality that you would never try before because it cost too much or the price a little bit more than you were willing to pay already and you got the reliability that came with it. Yeah, the premium product, if you can, anytime, I think a learning lesson here is like obviously a PR hack, if you can use news in, in a way to like fight the government or fight your local um, and you have enough money for legal fees, like you can use that as a PR hack and you're in the right, you have to be in the right on this, like, like progress and helping more people have jobs and things along those lines, like do that. And I think that anytime you can get people a wider audience access to a premium product at a reduced price, like you're going to win. You're going to win against the status quo. Yeah, I'm just going to jump straight to SpaceX because they cool. did basically the exact same thing. Um, their whole thing was we're going to create rockets that because they are reusable and less expensive and that's our ultimate goal we'll be able to charge i don't know what the price difference is but half or one third of what government contractors are currently uh paying or go government contractors are currently charging the government and when those government contractors and governments say we can't do it we're going to then go to the u.s people and say hey we're going to spend your tax dollars more efficiently because we have a better product are you gonna let the government waste your money and buy the more expensive product, which is inferior to ours because they've been doing it for 20 years and we have brand new innovations. So same lines where when you have a better product and you're in the right, which is you're saving money and you're doing something more innovative and the, the money belongs to the people, then it's very easy to push forward through news outlets and actually they sued the government instead of the government suing them. Cool. Um, that's all I have for right now. Questions from the audience? Jody, you got any questions? Um, I have some, well, I don't know much about SpaceX. I know Uber. Um, I just have like a comment about Uber. Like, I know that when I went to Las Vegas, they now have like Uber specific stations where they like specifically allow um, people to use it like and they don't use taxis anymore and when i went to canada they had uber um they didn't have uber they didn't allow any ubers in that area and you had to specifically rely on taxis this happens now in canada um and it was just really difficult we waited like an hour for three taxis to come and pick all of us up because we were in a big group it's really interesting that like some like Canada doesn't like rely on Uber like the U.S. does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know some, I don't know why, but I know some people who, um, one has a, a kid in New York City and he says, yeah, whenever I want my kid to like go to school on his own, I call a taxi for him. And I'm like, why do you call taxis instead of using Uber? And he says, because I'm still betting that the taxis will win and I still want them to win. And so it, it's funny that some people still want that because they want to be part of society or because they think that, you know, it's overbearing for someone like Uber to have all of our data. Um, but it, honestly, I think that's silly because it's, it's kind of where the future is going. I also think it's really, really uh, cool that at San Francisco airport, they used to have just one parking lot where they'd be like, go to this parking lot, get picked up for Uber. And there was always just a constant traffic jam in there because there was 50 or 60 cars constantly pulling in and pulling out. And they changed their entire top floor of their parking garage to be a circle instead of a parking lot where along the outside of the circle, they have 25 or 30 parking spots. And it tells you in your Uber app, like go to this one parking spot. And because they come in waves, it just makes the, like, the traffic so much easier. And I think it's crazy that we've gotten to the point that a large establishment like San Francisco airport, um, realizes that this little hacky thing which was taking over their parking garage has become so prevalent that they have to change their own system to allow for it. 
And I think um, what makes Uber better than like the taxi is also the customer service portion of it, where you are expecting a nice car where you get to rate your ride at the end of your trip. And it's like a community kind of where you know that you can rely on Uber because if you have a bad experience, you can tell someone that there's someone who will like help you. Whereas in taxis, it's kind of like you're upset and it smells like smoke and it's not always the best experience and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. There are some things that Uber can't do. Like you said, it smells like smoke. Um, I don't know if you can smoke in a taxi, but you can't bring kids in an Uber, but you can bring kids in a taxi. So there's, there's some things that um, I guess just laws haven't changed yet, but for some experiences, you still need to use taxis, but for most, it is nice that you can leave a review because I've never left a review for any taxi I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. And they'd laugh at you if you tried. So all you have to do, I think the net net is like, all you have to do if you're going to move into a new space or, or take over a space and you have to just be better than the BATNA, right? What's your best, best next alternative? And so if you can be better than a taxi, if you can be uh, better than uh, the MLS, if you can be better than uh, email, if you can be better than kind of the discount sites that are out there, what else do we have? Craigslist, better, better than a newspaper, uh, your, your startup or your business should be able to win over those things. Nice space video. All right. Yeah. That's all I got today. Uh, and uh, see that's you guys tomorrow. And Tomorrow, we'll be here with Jake, who's going over Blue Ocean startups. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye.